This morning is a little bit different since uh, both uh, Don and Diane are organist and pianist are away today, uh, but I do love having our handbell choirs here to lead us and also love just hearing your voices as they come uh, to proclaim the glory of God. This morning, I uh, want to share with you some of the scripture from uh, the letter of 1 John. It's found almost in the very end of the New Testament. And in this, the, the writer is a part of the Johannine community, the community that was formed around the Gospel of John itself. And so our reading starts at chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Will you bow your heads as we listen for the word of God? Oh God, we know that every good and abundant gift comes from heaven above. And so grant us the gift of your Holy Spirit that we may hear your word that is proclaimed and sung, that it may become the living word of God for us. For this we pray in your holy name. Amen. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed, but we know, but we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves as Christ is pure. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Whenever preachers gather together, we oftentimes like to tell jokes, especially on our colleagues, uh, I was visiting with one of our Roman Catholic priests, and he was uh, telling me the story about these two priests who had decided to go on vacation to Hawaii. And when they arrived, one of the priests said to the other one, let's, let's not wear our clerical collars. Uh, you know, they wanted to be kind of incognito, and, and that's not that surprising. You know, a lot of times uh, pastors and doctors and counselors don't really want to reveal who they are because people just start asking a lot of different questions. So when they arrived at their hotel, they went to a local shopping center and they bought these beautiful Hawaiian shirts. And the next day they went out to the poolside. They had their, their drinks and snacks and their Hawaiian uh, shirts on and were just out sunning, and then this beautiful woman in a, a, a very uh, kind of scanty bikini walked by, and she looked at them and smiled, and she said, hello, Father, hello, Father, and they walked off. And they said, how did she know that we're priests? We've got to go get some other kind of attire. So they went shopping again, and they got really wild, bright-colored shirts, and they bought new shorts and sunglasses and hats. And then when they went out to the pool that afternoon, this beautiful woman in a bikini comes walking by, and she stops and smiles, and she says, Hello, Father. Hello, Father. And one of them stood up and said, Young woman, how did you know that we are priests? And she said, oh, I'm Sister Claire from the convent. <laughs> true story. No, I don't know if it's true. You know, I identify with that because, you know, as pastors, uh, people people have their own presuppositions about who pastors are, and a lot of it comes from uh, either childhood experiences or uh, it may be what they've seen on the television. And in general, I'll just have to say, it's usually not very favorable. And so when I go on vacation, 
I like to go incognito. Now, whether you believe it or not, I don't wear my robes around the house all the time. Yeah, you can believe that? I don't know. But anyway, uh, you know, I, I just would rather be unknown. Not that I want to do anything immoral or illegal, but it's just simply sometimes we need the time off. Many times, though, when they find out I'm a pastor, uh, they respond, oh, okay. Or they try to tell you a joke where you're ending up the butt of the joke. Everybody thinks they know what a preacher is. On October 19th, 1987, I was a single man and I'd moved to West Houston, moved into a large singles kind of apartment complex. I'd been there for two weeks and had not met a soul. And so I determined that I was going to go out to the swimming pool and meet some people. I, I really wanted to make some friends. And so I go out on that day, and I'm looking around. There are people in the pool, and I look in the pool, and there's this guy floating face down in the pool. And he'd been that way for a long time. And I got in the pool, I lifted his head up, and I looked at him, and I said, stockbroker? And he said, how did you know? I said, just a lucky guess. You see, on October 19, 1987, was the single largest drop in the uh, Dow Industrial, um, in the stock market. It lost 22% of its value in that one day, and many of the stock market brokers were beginning to rethink whether it was really what they wanted to do with the rest of their life. And so we sat and we began to, ta uh, to listen to his story and he told me about his life. And then he came to that uh, inevitable question, what do you do? Now I'd already you know, predetermined, I didn't want to go out there and just say, well, I'm a Methodist preacher, you know, and because I didn't want it to be a conversation stopper. And so I, I swear, I heard these words coming out of my mouth. I work for a large multinational corporation. <laughs> this is a true story. And he said, oh, what's it called? I said, UMC. <laughs> and he said, I don't, I don't think I've ever heard of them. And I said, oh, they are uh, quite large. There's, uh, we're in you know, many different countries around the world and in the United States. We have about 45,000 branch offices. <laughs> well, he was beginning to get a little bit interested about that. And he said, well, what do you do for them? And I said, well, I am a, a crisis counselor in upper management. <laughs> and he said, well, where did you go to school? Went to SMU. Well, what kind of degree did you get? It was very specialized. <laughs> and I could tell that, you know, he was beginning to get really interested and he said, you know, I think that I might like to do something like that. And, and there was this picture in my mind of this flaming airplane crashing toward the earth, and I heard the words, mayday, 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 bail out, and I said, oh, you know, it, well, look at the time, I'd better be going right now. And I was muttering under my breath, crisis counselor for a large multinational corporation. You see, all of us, I think, wonder from time to time what it would be like to be someone else. We may look at uh, athletes, movie stars, singers, and wonder what kind of life that would be to stand before thousands of adoring fans 
who make all that money, have all that fame and fortune. I would really like to be that person. I would like to be, you know, in the in crowd, whether it is at school or in some kind of social situation or even at work. We, we want to be someone more than who we are right now. And I, I think that's an experience uh, that's universal. And that desire to be someone other than what we were created, I think that desire is actually the original sin. You see, when Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, and the tempter came and said to them, can you eat from any of the tree in the garden? Did not God forbid it? And they said, no, only the fruit of this tree. If we even touch it, we will die. And the tempter says, you won't die, but rather your eyes will be open to the knowledge of good and evil. And listen to this part. And you will become like God. Now that is something to strive for, isn't it? They, they wanted to be someone other than who they were. And they went grasping. They went trying to take for themselves that which was for God alone. And when they ate the fruit when they succumb to that desire to be someone else, the first thing that happened was shame, and then blame, and then they found themselves cut off from God and one another. You see, that's what happens, I think, when we are dissatisfied with our own lives, when we begin to feel that we're not good enough, and you can fill in the blank on whatever it is that you may feel that you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, or handsome enough, or beautiful enough, you may not be popular enough, you may feel like you're not loved enough. It doesn't really matter what it is. It is at the very heart of every one of us that we have these feelings of inadequacy because we want to be someone other than who we were created to be. And the Bible is full of these stories. The story of the prodigal son, you'll find it in Luke's Gospel, the 11th chapter, uh, many of us know it, some of us may not, but it's the story of a very wealthy man who had two sons. And the youngest of the two sons, when he was an adult, he said to his father, in effect, I wish you would drop dead. I wish that I could receive my share of your inheritance right now. You see, he wanted to go and make a name for himself. He wanted to live life on his own terms. And what's ironic was it would take what his father would give him upon his father's death. He wanted it right now. And instead of uh, you know, slapping the boy around and chastising him, instead he gives him his request. And the boy takes the money, and he leaves the only home that he has ever known. And he goes away to a distant country, where he begins to squander what he had in what the Bible calls riotous living. You ever wanted a riotous life? <laughs> sure you do. Why else do you play the lotto? You know, the guy that won the $533 million, you know, finally came forward. I could live on that. 
But the thing about the prodigal son is eventually uh, the newfound friends that came with his newfound wealth, when the wealth was gone, his friends disappeared as quickly as they appeared, and he found himself down on his luck, homeless, hungry. And the Bible says that when he came to himself, when he had that aha moment, that moment of realization that even my father's servants have it better than I, he determines to go back home, but not as a son, but as a servant. And his father, who every evening has stood on the porch of his home, looking across the fields, looking to the horizon for anything that looked Like his son, he was waiting. And finally, that fateful day, he saw something that looked familiar. Maybe it was the gait of his walk or how this man was holding himself, but he realized that it was his son, and he runs to go to him and meet him and showers him with love and forgiveness and reinstates him not as a slave but as a son because that was who he truly was. You see, when the author of 1 John makes the statement that we are children of God, it is a statement of an identity that cannot be taken away from us, no matter how we have lived our lives. We may have gone in search of becoming someone other than who we are. We may reject our identity as God's children, but it doesn't change the fact that God has made us in his image, and that is why we will always be his children Now, many people, many for us, that's really good news. I don't have to go wandering, wondering who I am, who's who's my daddy. I know who my daddy is. I know that my heavenly father has created me to be just a little lesser than himself. And it is that love, the grace that we have come to know in Jesus Christ that we receive our sonship and daughtership. I love the fact that we opened our worship service this morning with amazing grace. The story of one who was lost and then found, of one who was blind and then could see. And what they could see and what we can see is that no matter what we do, God is always waiting, willing to forgive and to open our eyes to the fact that we are his beloved children. We need not struggle with not being enough. And so here's what I want you to do when you're feeling down or discouraged. You can take notes if you'd like. It's really pretty simple. One short phrase. I am a child of God. No matter what situation you find yourself, You can stand in front of a mirror and just simply repeat, I am a child of God. It doesn't matter what the world may think of you. It doesn't matter what circumstances in life you are going through. They may not even change the way that you hope they would change. But we all need to hear that affirmation. I am a child of God. And one day we will be made perfect as Christ is already perfect. 
when he is revealed in his fullness. Thanks be to God that we are his children. Amen.